Hello and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff and I'm the Learning Program Developer at the Royal BC Museum. Today I'm coming to you from my office at the museum, which is located on the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, the Lekwungen speaking people in Victoria, British Columbia. Today is a special presentation for Oceans Week Victoria. Typically a one day celebration on June 8th, this year we are part of a week long celebration of activities and online pr presentations to foster connection and engagement with the community by providing a platform to support ocean inspired events on southern Vancouver Island. Tomorrow is the last day, but it's not too late to visit the website. It is oceansweekvictoria.ca for more information and resources and some fun online activities taking place. Today, my special guest is Parks Canada and Nicole Can, who's here to talk to us about Southern resident killer whales. Before the closures, the Royal BC Museum was planning to have opened our new feature exhibition called Orcas, Our Shared Future. And that has been postponed until May of 2021. But just because the exhibit is postponed doesn't mean that orcas won't be returning to the Salish Sea. So tell us more about it. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much, Kim, and the Royal BC Museum for having me here today. And thank you to all of you for taking time out of your schedule to join me. Uh, my name is Nicole Kent. Hello, bonjour. Thank you very, very much for joining us for RBC at Home with Parks Canada. And I am coming to all of you today from my home in North Delta, which is on the traditional territories of the Tuasin First Nation, as well as the Musqueam First Nations, and all Coast Salish peoples represented by by the Wasanic Leadership Council. I am extremely honored and humbled to live here, to love, and to be able to teach through my home as a result of COVID-19, to be able to be here on this land and to share with all of you about the things that matter to me and I hope matter to you, and that's why you've taken, given me the gift of your time today is a true honor. And I'd like for all of us to take a moment because I know I've been seeing in the chat over here and I do have to look away from the camera to look at the chat, it's a little technical there, but I've been seeing that we have people joining us from a number of different places. So far, I think mostly in Britain British Columbia. But to start us off today, I'd like to ask you to take a moment to think about where you are, what lands you're on, and whose traditional territory you may be, may be virtually spending time with us on today, and what that means to you. I think I feel centered and ready to, in the spirit of sharing, ask all of you to join me on a journey as we dive into the family trees of the southern resident killer whale. Now, I have a confession to make first and foremost. I am an orca-holic. I have been since I was four years old when I saw my very first killer whale. And I will probably use the word killer whale and orca interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Orca comes from the scientific name for the species, Orcinus orca. Killer whale is the sort of typical common name that we use for them. So right off the bat, apologies. I myself, even having studied these animals and loved these animals for more years than I care to admit at the moment, since I did already say I saw my first one and fell in love when I was four, I still end up using the word interchangeably, but I didn't want that to confuse anyone. In particular, today, we are going to be diving in, as I mentioned, to the world of the southern resident killer whale family and their family tree and how our families are intimately connected with theirs. I imagine that many of you will have questions throughout our time together today, and Kim has offered to collect those questions through the chat box, and I will probably be sharing stories for about 20 minutes or so, and we'll have 10 minutes at the end so that I can answer those questions, as many of them as possible, and if I don't get to all of them today, my colleague Rachel is going to share in the chat an email address so that we can continue the conversation and give you the opportunity to ask the questions you have. Now, I don't know about you, but certainly for myself over the last couple of months, I have really, really felt like the world has turned upside down more than once. And that has forced me to look inside myself in a number of ways. And I have found that a lot of my time lately has been spent thinking about family, thinking about my family, the families of others, and the families that matter to me. 
And I'd like now to start us off as we start to think about families and what they mean to Southern resident killer whales to invite you to close your eyes and think about your family first and foremost. What does your family mean to you? What does your family look like? What does your family feel like? Is your family a family that you were born into or is it one that you found over time? Is it a big family? Is it a small family? In the spirit of the Goldilocks story, it's the right fit family because it's yours and it's your family. And I would really, really love to know a little bit about your family so you can open your eyes. And in the chat, if you can share just one word for what your family means to you, I think that'll really help center us for the experience we're going to have getting to know Southern resident killer whale families and what those mean to those animals. So in the chat, please share just one word for what your family means to you. Look at the chat here to see what we have. We have safety, absolutely home. A couple more minutes. You know, thinking about just one word can be really, really tough, especially for for that that feeling of family. Shared history. It's two words. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> one thought. One thought. I think. Love. Absolutely. Acceptance. We're so lucky. We're so lucky to have so many different families as a human species. And I don't think I see any more words coming through. Lots of love coming up again. I'll be checking the chat after the program's finished to see what other words people had. And of course, I can't actually see on Facebook Live right now. So if people are sharing there, I will look forward to seeing those words there afterwards too. When I think about family, I often think about the fact that I really find myself caring about families, not just my own, but families of other humans. And human beings are not the only species that have families either. Southern resident killer whales are also incredibly dependent on their families, as are many other species as well. But we are here today to dig into the southern resident killer whale. And when we learn a little bit more about southern resident killer whale families, it becomes very clear that their families are multi-generational, nurturing, and inclusive. They also need help. And we can all protect killer whale families with the same deep-rooted love that we have for our own family. So to start us off on our adventure today, I am going to invite all of you on a very special behind-the-scenes journey with Parks Canada in the Gulf Islands National Park Reserve. I am going to imagine that you are all joining me on a vessel. We're going to be leaving right out of Sydney Harbour on Vancouver Island on a special Gulf Islands National Park Reserve vessel to head out and explore the park reserve and maybe we might even see some killer whales. Now, if you're not familiar with where Gulf Islands National Park Reserve is, if, as I saw from the chat, many of you are joining us from the province of British Columbia, if you've ever taken a boat, in particular, probably a BC ferry from mainland British Columbia, Vancouver, maybe up in Horseshoe Bay or Tawasin or further up the Sunshine Coast, and you've gone over to Victoria on Vancouver Island, you have traveled directly between a number of Gulf Islands, many of which make up the Gulf Islands National Park Reserve found in the Salish Sea. And I invite you now to imagine that you're getting on that staff vessel with me today. This is not something we usually can do, but through the magic of imagination and virtual technology, you're gonna get on board with me today and we're gonna see what we can see. Now, first of all, we obviously need a life jacket so we can be safe. So let's put on our life jackets over one arm, over the other arm. Do up those buckles, mine has three. We'll get those all nice and tight. Do the shoulder fit test. All right, we feel safe. Let's head out. Now, the thing about killer whales in the waters of Southern British Columbia, we are so lucky to have these killer whales coming along our coastline throughout the year, in particular in the summer. We're very, very lucky that they frequent the Salish Sea. 
but we have sometimes some trouble spotting them because there's lots of waves in our water. So I want all of you to use your eagle eyes. I've got my binoculars here with me. Look out on every side of the vessel here and see what you can see. Oh, wait, what's that? I saw a splash. Let's wait and see if there's anything. Oh, I think I might have seen. It might be southern. I'm not sure. I need to take a closer look. Oh, you didn't bring your binoculars? Here, let me give you mine. We'll see if you can get the focus right. I know binoculars are sometimes a little bit tricky when we first get them going, but let's see if you can see anything. What's that? I think we found a family of southern resident killer whales. As I mentioned before, these families are made up of multiple generations of males and females. Now the males are easier to identify for us from this distance because they have big, tall dorsal fins. So as we're watching the whales, if you see a big, tall dorsal fin, oh, I think I just saw one off in the distance there, point at it, that's one of the males in the family. All right, you can keep those binoculars with you and we'll continue on our adventure and see what else we can learn about this family of Southern resident killer whales. I think it may be easier for us to have a conversation about them if we come ashore. So let's head up onto Saturna Island, we'll dock our vessel, we'll go out to East Point and sit on the beautiful rocks that look at the Strait of Georgia, which is a well-known shore-based whale watch location. That family might come right along, you might not even need your binoculars, they might come back close to shore. As we have the opportunity to meet and observe southern resident killer whale families, it becomes very clear that that family structure is essential for their survival. In the southern resident killer whale community, there are three distinct pods. They are very unsurprising, or not, not, not necessarily unsurprising, unoriginally named J, K, and L pod. And the letters don't really stand for anything. It's just what they are from the scientific naming community. And so the J, K, and the L pods of the Southern Resident Killer Whale communities, each of them is their own family made up of distinct family groups. So within J pod, for example, there are three or four different immediate families. And these are called matrilines. A matriline is a family tree. Really, I have one here with me on the whiteboard that you might be able to see. And it's led by the oldest female in the family and all of her immediate descendants. Because in the Southern Resident Killer Whale community, when you're born, you are going to spend your entire life with your mom. Doesn't matter if you are a male or a female, you will live the rest of your life with your mom. Now, for those of you who are watching today and you are mothers, that might make you really excited or not. And for those of you who are children, you probably have some other feelings about that. But that's just life in a Southern resident killer whale family. And this family will do everything together. They will travel together, travel very long distances, even though we are lucky to have Southern resident killer whales here with us in Southern British Columbia, they can be seen as far south as Southern California and as far north as sort of Northern British Columbia. So they'll travel together, they'll hunt together, they'll eat together and play and sleep. They are extremely nurturing of their family bonds. So much so that when they catch something to eat, they actually make sure that every individual in their natural line, in their family group, gets to share in that one fish. They're also extremely inclusive because you don't have to be born into a family in order to belong there. Even though most of the time when you are born as a calf, you will spend your life with your mother, sometimes your mother might be lost. And that has happened to a couple of members of the Southern Resident Killer Whale community. In particular, I am thinking of a killer whale named Onyx. His designation number, his ID number is L87. And he lost his mother in 2005. But he has since been adopted by a family in K-Pod. 
And then a little bit later, he actually changed pods again and he found another new family. He now spends all of his time traveling with j -Pot. The matriarch or the oldest member typically of a family or a pod or the great great grandmother of the pod is the glue that holds the entire pod together. Granny was the oldest known killer whale to ever be found in any ocean. And when she passed away a couple of years ago, she was thought to be 105 years old. She was the leader of J-Pod for decades. And it was her job to ensure that her pod's culture and traditions were passed on to every new generation. I was extremely lucky to have the opportunity to see Granny myself a number of times before she passed away. And it was clear, even from a distance and on board a boat, how important she was to the survival of her family. Her loss must have been devastating for j -Pot. Not only to lose a treasured family member, a loved one, but also because that leadership role needed to be filled. And so after a couple of years of some transitional time for j -Pot, we now think that this family tree I have represented here, one of the unique matrilines in the j -Pod family, is now an oldest surviving member, her name is Shachi. She was born in 1979, and she has now, we think, taken over the overarching leadership role of j -Pot. This is a look, and we'll bring this a little bit closer afterwards if you'd like to see, of her direct family members, but she's now also, we think, taking on that leadership role of all of j -Pod. Our families have so much in common with the families of Southern resident killer whales, but killer whale families also suffer direct consequences because of our family's behavior. Southern resident killer whales are endangered and they are at serious risk of extinction. While I'm speaking to you today, there are only 72 members of the Southern resident killer whale family left. Now it's important to know that when we say something is extinct, that something is gone forever. But when something is endangered, it means it's not too late. What any family tree needs to survive is strong roots. And there are three roots in particular that Southern resident killer whale families need so that they can be strong and stable in their family tree. First, they need quiet spaces. The world of the ocean is very noisy, and the critical habitats of southern resident killer whales are very close to a number of big cities like Vancouver, Victoria, and Seattle. And southern resident killer whales use sound to survive. They echolocate to find food, so they make click sounds like this. which work like a boat sonar system. But in order for it to work for the killer whale, they have to hear those clicks coming back to them. They also vocalize with each other, make lots of noise, talking, and really reinforcing those family bonds. But the noise of the ocean, especially when we add boats to the mix, can make it hard to hear. Not even going to make you listen to that large vessel for very long. It's only one of the roots that these animals need to have strong, stable family trees. They also need food. And in the chat, you might already know this because I think it's probably one of the best known things about resident killer whales. What is their favorite food? They are very, very picky eaters. If anyone in the chat wants to share, if anyone knows what the very, very picky eaters the southern resident killer whales like to eat. See it coming in from a couple of people. Salmon, absolutely. Now here on our coastlines in British Columbia, we are very lucky. We have five species of Pacific salmon. And although resident killer whales can sometimes dabble in any of those five species, they're by far favorite that makes up over 90% of their diet is the Chinook salmon which as humans, we also like a lot. I think we like a lot of salmon. 
salmon is one of the most preyed upon animals by so many other species that it's important for this root to survive, they need to have enough salmon to eat. And then finally, they also need to have clean spaces to live. Killer whales are very vulnerable to contaminants and we are all connected because as Finding Nemo taught us, all drains lead to the ocean, or at least most of them do. So now that we know what some of the challenges are that Southern resident killer whales are facing, we can't ignore those challenges. You and your family can help to save theirs. The government of Canada is working together like a family to help protect them through science and monitoring projects, enforcement of regulations, and outreach interpretive and education programs like this. But you can also help to strengthen the roots of their family trees so that they can thrive. When it comes to quiet spaces, we can add ourselves, little person here, as a root to their family tree by ensuring that those spaces stay as quiet as possible. And you can help with this whether you're on or off the water. On the water, you want to make sure you're aware of what the guidelines are. Be whale-wise with your vessel and follow the new management measures that have been put into place. And if you aren't sure what they are, ask, because they do change year to year. This year in Gulf Islands National Park Reserve, you have to stay 400 meters away from all killer whales. That is like if you were at the start of a golf hole and the killer whale was all the way at the hole itself. It is far away. So you might actually be able to get closer to killer whales if you were to watch them from land. There are many well-known shore-based whale watch locations in Gulf Islands National Park Reserve and Pacific Rim National Park Reserve. And by doing, taking those steps to stay far away or to even stay on land, we can help make sure the oceans are a little bit quieter. When it comes to adding ourselves to strengthen the root of the food for the killer whales, we just need to make sure we're asking questions about where our seafood is coming from and how it was caught and ensuring that it's sustainable. There are lots of programs that can help you choose sustainable seafood all over the world. Here in BC, one of the best known is the Oceanwise program. If you search Oceanwise in your favorite search engine, you will find a logo that will help you learn whether, just by visually looking at your seafood, whether it's sustainable or not. And finally, when it comes to clean spaces, we can add ourselves to the root by making sure we know how our waste is being disposed of, being careful with things that go down our drain, or maybe even just making your own completely friendly, environmentally friendly cleaners by combining water and vinegar. I have an almost two-year-old child at home, and this will get rid of almost every mess that he makes in the house, and it's perfectly safe for the environment. By working together, we can all help to keep the Salish Sea safer for all living southern resident killer whales and also future generations. Future generations like little Tofino here. Tofino, or J59, is Shachi's great niece, and she was born last year. She's a member of JPOD, and JPOD has struggled, as have all southern resident killer whales, to produce young calves that survive after birth. So when Tofino was born, we celebrated, but now that she's approaching her first birthday, we're celebrating even more. She is a symbol of hope and a reminder to all of us that it is not too late for us to keep their family safe through working with ours. Southern resident killer whale families are multi-generational, nurturing, and inclusive, and we can help to protect their families with the same deep-rooted love that we have for our own. I would like to thank the Royal BC Museum, and Kim in particular, for inviting me here today to share the Southern resident killer whale family stories with you, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to invite me into your home, maybe even with your family, to learn a little bit more about how we can help theirs. On behalf of Parks Canada, thank you, Nessie, and thank you for joining us. I think we have time for some questions, Kim. Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, you I, muted. <laughs> I muted myself. <laughs> so thank you. While we wait for a few questions to come in, Nicole, you said you were four years old when you saw your first orca. Do you remember what? Do you remember that? Can you tell us what that was? Where? I do. I remember it 
so vividly uh, that it has really shaped my entire life. Uh, when I heard today that I was being invited to share share in my love of Southern resident killer whales and the love that so many other people have, my life from when I was four and everything that's happened since there has been completely changed because of that experience I had. I'm from Winnipeg, Manitoba originally, and my parents brought me out to Vancouver to visit my aunt when I was four for the first time, and she brought me to the Vancouver Aquarium, which again, to date myself a little bit, at that time, they did have killer whales there. So that was my first experience, and I was hooked. I wanted to be a killer whale for a very long time. And then I've sort of let go of that dream, but it's still there. And now just working to, to share and protect them is the best thing I could think of doing. Oh, absolutely. Um, as we were getting ready for our feature exhibition on orcas, I had to learn a lot more about them. And uh, speaking of the matrilines and the families you were talking about today, I found that uh, really fascinating. Uh, and thank you for highlighting that. Um, Silva has a question. Uh, her sure. question, has killer whale research been continuing over the last few months? Has that research still been happening, even though people may have been, um, have some restrictions? Of course, that's a great and very important question. So I think one of the things to think about when it comes to, especially the killer whales we see along our coastline, we, we say that we see them more in the summer. And we do know that they travel to other parts of the world in the winter and sometimes the summer as well. They are unpredictable. But that doesn't mean they aren't here in the winter. Most of what we know about these animals comes from studying them on the water. And for those of you who are from British Columbia, you know that going on the ocean in a small research vessel in January is maybe not what you signed up to do. <laughs> so there are just less people studying them in what we call the off season, which is pretty much from about November to April. Or so, but there are still very dedicated scientists and naturalists who spend some of their time in that wintry season out on the water, and they have been able to do that as long as they are practicing safe social distancing measures, which is harder on a boat, but not impossible. The other thing that's going on with research in the sort of winter season and as COVID-19 has been uh, just really sort of on all of our minds, what researchers who aren't on the water in the winter season do is they process their data and they analyze their research in the winter season. So that has absolutely been happening as well. And we look forward to seeing those results. And everyone can actually be uh, ocean scientists. Uh, there is a program uh, that's BT Cetacean Sighting Network. They ask if you see a uh, an orca, a killer whale, or other whales, could even be sea lions, turtles, that you report them by calling 1-866-I-SAW-ONE, which is easy to remember, I hope, or uh, you can also <laughs> visit wildwhales.org. So you can report your whale sightings too. It's important for people to know. Uh, yeah, there's even, I'll add to that, Kim, there's even an app, a free app you can download for the sightings network where you can report your sightings right from your phone live while you are seeing it. It's amazing. You can even add pictures. So do it. Don't, don't think, oh, someone's probably already reported it. Does, you can also do it. Um, Debbie Lee is watching on Facebook and she wonders, Nicole, if you have seen Tofino yourself. Have you oh. seen it yet? her yet? That is a great question, Debbie, and sadly, I have not. Um, I am very jealous of my friends and colleagues who have had the opportunity to see Tofino live and in person. I've seen many, many cute videos and pictures. I have been taking care of my own young born calf. <laughs> so, so up until September of last year when she was born, I was actually on maternity leave with my firstborn son, my little, my little whale here and I have not had the chance to get back out on the water since we heard about Tofino and since I've been back to work but I will keep my fingers crossed anytime that I'm in the Salish Sea that I get to see that little whale. Oh great and Mary also on Facebook is wondering how do you spell the name of the new matriarch of the J-Pod that replaced Granny? Great question. I sometimes struggle with the pronunciation, so thank you for asking this question because the spelling, I can tell you, it is S-H-A-C-H-I. So I tend to say that as Shachi, and I have heard that as sort of the most common pronunciation, but again, it's S-H-A-C-H-I, and her identification number is J-19. Great. 
And if people want to keep up on the news uh, of those orcas, who do you recommend? What is the site? Where do you guys get your updates from? Well, we will at Parks Canada be sharing a lot of updates on what's going on with the Southern Resident Killer Whales in particular over the summer. My colleague Rachel is in the chat and I think she has a couple of links that she's going to share. One of the links is, so if you're going out on the water in a vessel, you'll have the link to the new management measures so that you can be safe and make sure that you're following all of the guidelines put in place, all of those management measures to keep these whales safe. And Rachel's also going to have an email address that she's going to post there so that you can ask you can continue the conversation so that if you have further questions about the Southern Resident Kill, including what's going up, what did they get up to, that you can send that link to, the, sorry, you can send your question to the email in the link that Rachel is sharing in the chat. There's just a couple of questions left, if you don't oh, mind, Nicole, we'll take of course. Them and then and then put, then we'll share that link so you can keep asking your questions. Mark is wondering uh, how hurtful are hydroelectric dams on their effects of salmon stock and food supply for resident orcas? As you mentioned, food is a really important route for the health of these orca families. So are are those dams, hydroelectric dams, harming them in any way? It's a very important question, Mark. I can't say that I know very deeply the specifics of hydroelectric dams on salmon stock population information in the specifics, but I do know that dams and habitat loss are one of many problems facing salmon. And the list of problems facing this critically important fish and all five species of this fish could go on and it could be as long as my body. So dams, other habitat loss, pollution because salmon spend their time not just in the ocean but also in freshwater rivers, they're really facing double threats to their population. So anything that we can do to keep their habitats accessible for them, clean, rebuilding those habitats and also making sure that we are only taking our fair share out of the ocean and leaving enough salmon at all stages of their life because they're an important prey species as adults for the resident killer whales but also as young juvenile salmon for a lot of the other animals that make up the food web of the Salish Sea. Yes and Amanda's wondering and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering this too what do you think about whale watching companies? She says she wants to watch whales, but she wants to do it right. I think worrying about that means that your heart's in the right place. I can't paint any anything, actually, with the same brush on any topic. I think one of the things that we can do as informed citizens is ask questions. I think that's one of the most valuable things we can do as individuals. So when it comes to whale watching, I don't think every whale watch company is created equal. I don't think that all whale watch companies are great. I don't think all of them are bad either. I think that as a whole, people want to help these animals. And so for you as a consumer, you can vote with your dollars. And if you call a number of the companies that are operating in your area, you ask them questions about what are the education programs on board your vessel? Do you always follow the management measures? Are you donating a portion of your proceeds to killer whale research and conservation efforts? Asking those questions will mean that you feel comfortable giving your money to a company that's going to help you build a deeper connection with those animals, as well as a company that's going to help protect those animals too. And as I mentioned in the program, there are also lots of very well-known shore-based whale watch locations that you can go to as well. I have seen killer whales almost every time that I have been to East Point on Saturna Island in the Gulf Islands National Park Reserve. Now that doesn't mean that if you go that you can call me and say, Nicole, there's no killer whales here because they are wild animals and they can travel wherever they are. But it's pretty remarkable to be able to see them as a surprise when, when you're on land. Uh, I had the pleasure when I first moved here, we went to Salt Spring Island and we were walking in Ruckles Park and we heard whoosh, whoosh, 
and just looked and there were some killer whales uh, swimming by us there. And I thought it was, it was the most moving experience. It was such a beautiful welcome to British Columbia. Thank you, Nicole, for all the time that you gave us today on all the wonderful information. If you still want more information, there's lots of sites you can find. Uh, one of the sites are uh, mentioned online on our chat window here is whalemuseum.org. They have a meet the whale section, so you can find a lot more information about the southern resident killer whale population there. Uh, Nicole, is there anybody who who's gives you like updates about where they are right now, if, uh, where the southern residents might be? Is there an well, app that's a bit of a tricky question, Kim, because as a, a researcher and, and also a naturalist myself, I do have access to some of that information, but it's not always accessible to the public. And the reason is for the protection of the whales themselves. So it's very, very rare that there's any kind of publicly available location live sort of real time for southern resident killer whales because even though we all are doing our best to help protect them we also want to make sure that we don't end up in a situation where there are more boats on the water seeing them even from a safe distance than there are whales. That's a really great reason. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Well, again, thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Parks Canada, uh, for taking the time to share with us today. I think really important messages about things we can do uh, to help protect the southern resident killer whale population. Uh, the Royal BC Museum uh, will be reopening on Friday, June the 19th. So as a staff member, I'm very thankful to the teams that have been working hard to ensure the safest conditions for our staff, volunteers, partners, and visitors. And you can find out more about our reopening on our website. And next Thursday, our at-home program, we're going to we're going to show you what what's happened here, what the new measures are, where the lineups go, where you can stand, where you can clean your hands, all of that good stuff. So Thursday at noon, if you want to join back at our RBCM at home, we'll walk you through all of that so you can feel comfortable and safe returning. We will be continuing our at-home, our at-home kids and at outside programs for the foreseeable futures. And links for all of these programs are posted on the Royal BC Museum's website. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, here on Zoom and on Facebook. Thank you for, or if you're gonna, if you're watching this recording, thank you for including us in some of your screen time. And please keep taking care of yourselves and one another. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.